Hello, my geeselings. This is Robinson Earhart with the introduction, and I guess it's also pins my cat if you're watching on YouTube, with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, hopefully number 33, with Quay Sean Spencer from the University of Pennsylvania. And I was lucky enough to snag Quay Sean because he got his PhD in philosophy and his uh, master's in biology from Stanford. So uh, I had that connection going for me. But anyway, he was such a great guest. We talked about the philosophy of race and its connection to the philosophy of science because he's a trained chemist and biologist. So he really, I think, tackles these questions with the perspective of not just a philosopher, but a scientist. So we talk about natural kinds. We talk about natural kinds and race. We talk about the abuse of research in philosophy of race. So, for instance, even though this is absolutely not uh, Quaishan's goals, they're actually quite countered his goal, his goals. Uh, white nationalists sometimes cite his work, and he very quickly, as he points out uh, in the podcast, has to nip it in the bud because that is so opposed to his purpose. But when you're working in sensitive areas like this, you always, I mean, run uh, the risk of your work being misappropriated. We also talk about Kant's racism, which I hadn't known about at all. Uh, and then, so his theories of race, how they were important uh, to thinkers around that time and colonialists, as well as we also talked about phrenology and, and craniometry, the latter of which I hadn't known existed. But anyway, uh, this podcast was great. You can look to some of his new work coming out in the future. He's working on a book that's an introduction to the philosophy of race. And he's also working on a book that will be about a pluralist solution to puzzles in the philosophy of race. And you'll hear him talk more about that toward the end of the podcast. So again, this was a great discussion, like the last episode with Ray Briggs, if this is in fact episode 33, it covered a topic that I really didn't know anything else know anything about beforehand, but that unlike maybe philosophy of math or philosophy of physics does have a lot of applications or practicality in everyday life. And they're, they, uh, both these topics, I mean, concern questions that you should be asking yourself and thinking about as you're just walking around. But without any further ado, I hope you really enjoyed this conversation and you got out of it, or you get out of it as much as I did. I found myself curious about your having taken or majored in both chemistry and philosophy in undergrad at Cornell. Because, I mean, you see people just taking philosophy or philosophy and math, but philosophy and chemistry isn't really a combination I've seen before. And I was wondering if that was because you already knew you wanted to do philosophy of science. Um, yeah, that isn't a combination you see a lot. I've met maybe two other philosophers of science who also have an undergraduate degree in chemistry and one of them I work with, so Michael Weisberg at Penn. Oh, cool. Um, it's, 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 it's the other one. Um, no, absolutely not. I, I had planned on becoming a biochemist oh. um, when I entered um, undergrad, and I was I was I was planning on going to medical school, doing an MD PhD biochemistry, and then uh, being a research physician in a, a medical college. Um, and that was a pretty straightforward outgrowth of my my high school. I went to a math and science academic magnet in Nashville and uh, pretty close by was Meharry Medical College. And we had this requirement every year to do a science science fair study. But because, you know, this is a school of like like science nerds, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were like doing studies in labs at nearby colleges like Vanderbilt, like some of them, like their their fathers or whatever were professors at Vanderbilt. Um, I didn't have any connections immediately but my uh, ap bio teacher hooked me up with uh, somebody she knew at meharry and then from then on I, I every year i kept doing my science fair projects at meharry and senior year 
uh, Samuel Adunia, the, the the chair, he's still the chair of the biochemistry department, uh, was my PI. And um, it was just a really rewarding experience. I actually won the the Middle Tennessee State Science Fair. That's Congratulations. Science Fair in Tennessee. <laughs> in uh, the category of biochemistry. And um, I just love everything about being a professor. And I, I loved chemistry and biochemistry. I remember one time they took a, a research trip, everyone but me in the lab, uh, to somewhere in Europe. And they were sending me back pictures. And they're like, yeah, I hope everything's going well in the lab. You know, we're, we're just working over here. I'm like, working? <laughs> like how are you working at but this was the life of a professor right you can travel go to conferences mm -hmm. you know you you network you 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 uh, improve your your education see what what other new stuff is out there in your field um i also like that they didn't my advisor he didn't really have i know he had a boss it was the dean of the medical college but he didn't that person he never really saw, never really interacted with, right? And I, that was very attractive that you're kind of um, very uh, 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 kind of independently working. You, you have to be focused to be able to get your stuff done. Um, but you didn't have like the supervisor that was immediately. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to be a biochemistry professor. Um, but uh, that dream got changed in college to become a philosophy of science professor. Um, but no, I, I, um, I, I majored in chemistry immediately when I got to campus and, uh, I picked up philosophy later. Um, so I was, I was kind of a, a AWOL scientist, so to speak. Yeah. So, so you went in, you wanted to be a, a biochemist. How then though, did you decide that you wanted to become a philosopher of science because that seems like a big shift i mean the minority of people going in who want to do science end up doing philosophy of science i mean the vast minority well you know i thought there were enough people working on cancer biology and no, it's just, it's like, <laughs> i mean there, it was really just um it was a slow process so i i uh got into the philosophy major just partly because, you know, the beginning of, 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 of various semesters, you're shopping around, shopping for courses and so forth. And um, I just sat in on this philosophy. I think it was a, it was a uh, philosophy of color sort of, sort of seminar. Okay. And I said, oh, this is really cool. Like all these different, you know, you can philosophize on color. <clears throat> and I had always been a cantankerous person and a hard to convince person. And so philosophy seemed like a good, sort of thing to explore um so the i actually signed up though for an ancient philosophy course i think that was my first philosophy course and um, i just loved it i love socrates and whatnot so i just you know kept taking those courses then eventually uh, a professor encouraged me to major majored in philosophy um but the way that it was structured at cornell at the time uh that that was it was really designed to be a second major you you know, they, they weren't expecting many people to go on to graduate work in, in philosophy. Um, so you can kind of take whatever you want it, uh, so to speak, and kind of design your own major. And I designed my philosophy major to complement my chemistry major. Um, so I took a lot of philosophy of science courses. Um, and I bumped into Richard Boyd. Uh, he was the uh, I took a course with him uh, junior year. It was graduate level slash advanced undergraduate philosophy of science course. Um, and it actually delved into a topic that had been on my mind since high school. And um, the way that we tackled it, it was just so intriguing. And I said, I want to do that. I want to, these are the questions I want to answer. And um, from the last day of that course, I changed my sort of career ambitions to become a philosophy of science professor instead of a biochemistry professor. So, yeah, it was it was, it was a good course. It was, yeah, yeah. So a lot of your work is philosophy of science, philosophy of biology, and then you also do philosophy of race. And the two aren't necessarily linked. I mean, there are a lot of people doing philosophy of race who 
aren't doing philosophy of science at all. And I'm curious, do you, and, and you refer to yourself as a philosopher of science. So is your, when you do philosophy of race, are you very much considering it as a branch of philosophy of science? Oh. Good. Um, I, I see philosophy, philosophy of race now is definitely its own subfield of philosophy. When I was in graduate school, um, that wasn't the case. Um, but by the time I was about to graduate, um, and certainly after I had graduated the first couple of years, I mean, there were jobs in philosophy of race. Um, and that, that's, that's when you become an official AOS, right? When, when people are advertising jobs. You know? <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's its own thing. Uh, it's been around for a while. Um, uh, philosophers philosophizing on race goes back at least to Immanuel Kant in the um, uh, uh, 18th century. And um, uh, kind of more contemporary issues kind of got up and started in the 70s and the 80s, uh, mostly among political philosophers, but also there was a little bit of action from some philosophers of language and metaphysicians. Um, so I would definitely consider philosophy of race its own thing. Um, however, yeah, the way that I do it is very intertwined with philosophy of science. So, and that just kind of has to do with how I got interested in it. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of philosophers of race get into uh, uh, philosophy of race for normative considerations. They had some personal experiences or they, they were always interested in normative considerations and um, this seems like a good place to put put your effort. Um, you know, concerns about racism, reparations, racial justice, things like that. Uh, that wasn't me. I, I, not to say I didn't care about those things, but that, <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't what drew me into philosophy of race. Uh, it was a scientific question. Uh, so let me take you back to my high school. So I said um, we had you know, a bunch of science nerds. And, um, you know, this was, uh, where, where are you from, by the way? Chicago. Chicago. Mm -hmm. Okay. I actually don't know. What would be like the academic magnet equivalent to um, a place like, you've heard of Stuyvesant in New York City? Yeah, uh, I'd say probably that Walter of... Payton is actually what the school is Walter called. Walter Payton, okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I've heard of that. Okay. So that's that's the level at which uh, the school I went, it was called Martin Luther King Magnet. And, um, you know, I mean, you had to be kind of cream of the crop to sort of sort of get in there. Um, uh, but yet, there was this strange phenomenon that happened my sophomore year. So sophomore year, you know, a lot of high school students take the PSAT. And, you know, we took the PSAT. And before that, there wasn't really any rhyme or reason to who was doing, at least not racially, who was like top in the various courses that we were taking, um, physics, chemistry, whatever, just whoever was studying the most probably. Um, so I, I saw lots of high performing African-Americans and so forth. We had a pretty diverse um, high school. Uh, but when it came to in the PSAT, uh, you definitely saw a racial gap in the scores. And uh, so African-Americans were scoring on average, at least a standard deviation below the white students and Asian students. Um, and also the, the thickness of the upper tail of the curve uh, was, was different for the white students versus black students. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> like, they, like, why is this happening? Um, and the same year was when the bell curve came out. It came out my sophomore year in high school. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this book. I have this heard of a, it. I have heard of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it has got a little bit of renewed attention um, in uh, uh, more recent generations because I think Charles Murray has been doing a book tour, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, uh, he's writing some new stuff. But so so Charles Murray and Richard Hernstein were two social scientists. Uh, one did their graduate work at MIT, one did at Harvard. Uh, one was a political science scientist, one was a psychologist. And um, they were, for some reason, very consumed with tests of cognitive ability. And so they were looking at IQs and SATs and ACTs and 
GMATs and, and you know, GREs and so forth. And they found this pattern of, 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 of black students, black test teachers underperforming relative to white students and Asian students. And um, they advanced in, I think it was chapter 13 of the book, but it was a chapter of the book where um, they said that the gap was partially due to the environmental cause but partially due to basically uh, a genetically based intellectual inf inferiority. Um, and as you can imagine, this was uh, a, not a popular hypothesis that they proposed in the 90s. Um, lots of academics um, uh, had criticisms. I, I heard about this stuff. I was in high school. I heard about it. I was like, huh, that's a interesting explanation for the gap, <laughs> you know. But I was a science lover. I went to a science high school, loved science. I didn't really have the tools, the conceptual uh, wherewithal to productively critique, you know, some MIT, Harvard trained social scientists. Um, but I always kept it in the back of my mind. So that course I told you about with Richard Boyd, uh, it was a course on kind of the epistemic and metaphysical limits of science to see whether science can give us objective knowledge and, and get us information about objective reality um, with a case study on the bell curve. And so it was uh, a, a course that basically was designed for me to address my curiosities that popped up in, in high school. So when we got into that stuff, we, we didn't just get into the typical experimental design, statistics, uh, population genetics, like all this science related stuff. But we, we made philosophy of science critiques. We looked at things like, well, and the one that stood out to me the most was well are the racial is the racial scheme used in the book even a scheme of natural kinds and genetics right can you uh, and, and maybe you're about to but could you explain what you mean by a, a natural kind of racial schemes and just because yeah, not everybody so listening is, is a philosopher and right. I, I don't even necessarily know <laughs> right right good so uh uh i i was just in the right place at the right time because richard boyd um he was one of the leading scientific realists, uh, which is roughly a philosophical view and philosophy of science, that mature empirically successful scientific theories are uh, approximately true in terms of uh, 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 tracking objective reality. Um, and he was just getting into his natural kind theory kick when I was in the, it was in the late 90s when I was uh, in his class. Um, and in, in, in short, natural kind theory is a theory in philosophy of science, even though there's other philosophers that talk about natural kinds, metaphysicians, and it's, it's not really all aimed at the same target. And philosophy of science has a specific target. Um, and it goes back to this philosopher of science, Nelson Goodman, um, who uh, in the 1950s wrote a book called Fact, Fiction, and Forecast. And in it, he threw out various puzzles for philosophers of science to solve. And one of them was called The New Riddle of Induction. Um, and it's just a, a lovely, lovely book. I think it's one of the biggest uh, puzzles in, in philosophy, the history of philosophy of science. Um, but basically, there's this, there's this historical problem about how do we justify inductive inference? So these inferences about... Um, you have a sample of a population, you want to make a reliable inference about information about the population, right? And, um, you know, these are probabilistic inferences. And David Hume, for a long time, philosophers were working on David Hume's problem of induction, which is basically, how do you justify rules of induction? That's a rough way of putting it. Um, and the puzzle there is, to justify rules of induction, you've got to use deduction or induction. Using induction is circular. Using deduction is unhelpful. Um, and there's ways around the puzzle that Hume created because, well, maybe you can use non-deductive rules to justify inductive rules, like maybe abduction or something. Right. Um, so that's one problem. In Goodman's book, Fact, Fiction, and Forecast, he outlined a completely separate problem but related to Hume's. Um, even if we have these wonderfully justified inductive rules, you keep your inductive rules fixed, we still have this uh, problem of being able to justify our inductions. And so far as the 
the classification scheme that we use in observation is radically underdetermined. It's basically a classification underdetermination problem. Okay. So his the example he throws out in the book is, well, suppose you have a geologist that follows all the rules of statistics, modern statistics. You do a random representative sample of uh, a group of, uh, I think they, um, was it, it wasn't diamond. It was some kind of gem. Um, I'm going to change it a little bit. Um, let's let's say it's a, a bird species like raven. Say you do a representative random sample of ra raven, and then you observe that all the ravens in your uh, sample are black. Um, so the inference, the reliable inference of induction that modern statistics tells you to make is, well, uh, uh, all ravens are black, and the next raven you observe will be black. Um, but Goodman uh, puts forth uh, this problem of, well, what did you really observe? Um, yes, you could use the predicate raven to categorize your observations, but you can use the predicate uh, rave crow. I'm just coming up with <laughs> yeah, this. Fine. <laughs> you know, here's an example, but you can say a rave crow is an observed raven or unobserved crow. So why do we carve up the world in terms of ravens instead of rave crows, ravens and crows instead of rave crows, right? Um, because any observation, any sample of ravens is going to be a sample of rave crows. And uh, notice that if you were to have articulated your observations differently, um, you would have been forced into making a different induction, mm -hmm. uh, namely that uh, all um, all rave crows are black right. and the next um, uh uh, rave crow you observe will be black. Um, but the, the the challenge is, well, you can carve up the world any number of ways, um, and um, uh, there's not really any seeming constraint on how you're carving up the world when you're doing inductions. Um, and so how do you justify making one induction over another in cases where you actually get different inductions. Now I'm thinking mm -hmm. that example isn't the best because both ravens and crows are presumably and black. Rave robins <laughs> or something. Well, come, come up with yeah, a rave, a rave robin yeah. or something. And then the next uh, uh, rave robin you observe will be uh, robins are what? Red, Blue? I think. Red. Red okay. breast robin, yeah. Uh, the next, next one you observe will be red instead of black. So now you have complete competing inductive inferences um, and uh, – you're using the same statistical rules, right? Maybe a student's t test with, you know, 95% confidence level, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so there's a deeper classification problem here. Um, Goodman had his own solution to that. Lots of philosophical science don't think it works. It's called entrenchment theory. Um, but Quine suggested Goodman move to Harvard and Quine was his colleague. Quine has a paper called natural kinds where he basically threw out natural kinds as the uh, solution to Goodman's new rule of induction and say, look, um, if, if the predicates that you're using are picking out natural kinds, then uh, the inductions that you're making all else equal, right? You're using the, uh, the justified rules of modern induction or whatever your solution of Hume's problem is. Um, it's going to be a justified induction, mm -hmm. right? And then the problem becomes, well, then what's a natural kind, right? Yep. Uh, so in that paper, natural kind, so Quine points out, it's like, well, there's something about uh, making the induction all ravens are black versus the induction all all non-ravens are non-black, which this is tied into a different problem. Philosophy. This is uh, one from Hempel. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, those two have the same truth conditions, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, one's the contra positive of the other. Um, so like, why can't I make that induction versus the other and quiet solution that is going to be the same as a solution to new induction, which is, you're not using the right kind of predicates, right? Uh, uh, non-black, non-raven, these are not natural kind predicates, right? <clears throat> and so that's, um, uh, a deep problem in philosophy of science. It's one that actually, um, uh, was independently discovered in taxonomy. So, um, we hear you're, you're, you're classifying organisms into taxa um, and you're trying to identify species, genre, orders, and so forth. 
And since the beginning of taxonomy, there's been debates about the right way to do that. And currently in taxonomy, there are three different schools of thought on, on how to do that. So if you go to a zoo, I can tell you which kinds of biologists are running the zoo. Because really? That's funny. You'll get different carvings in different zoos. Like, for example, the phylogenetic taxonomists, um, they don't believe in the existence of reptiles. Reptilia is not a real taxon for them. Huh. Um, but evolutionary taxonomists do. And so if you go to a zoo, you say, oh, these are reptiles. Like, oh, okay, I know. I know who's running this zoo, right? But so this is this is a problem that's that's you know in any part of science where you're classifying things. So there are these problems in early chemistry, how to organize a periodic table, right? Um, problems in organic chemistry on how to privilege, how to name organic molecules such that you're privileging the right stuff and not uh, the wrong stuff, right? And there's a whole history of different ways of how we classified molecules in organic chemistry. Um, you know, you're going to have this good Manian problem. Uh, but in it, you know, in all cases, you know, Quine's thesis is doing, you're going to solve this problem with um, making your predicates pick out natural kinds. And then it's, <laughs> then it's, then it's a free for all for trying to articulate what's the right essence of a natural kind such that you get this reliable induction you're after. And there's various different theories on natural kinds. So, so then going back to the bell jar, then the the course with Boyd, he was, I'm guessing, um, convincing you that their scheme did not accurately pick out um, a natural kind to justify the induction, <laughs> the inductions, or the 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 good thing about that course is Boyd didn't. Uh, it was it was hard to it was, it was like a little bit of a chess player. It's hard to sort of sort of guess his position on things, except for his theories and his work. Um, so so we we know what he thought a natural kind was. It was he was doing he was developing his theory of the homeostatic property cluster natural kind, which was a subkind of I guess we could call it a Boydian natural kind in general. Um, and he was working on that stuff uh, at the time of the course. So we knew what he thought a natural kind was, um, but he didn't have a particular position on uh, whether the authors of that book were carving up racial groups in such a way that they mapped onto natural carvings and genetics. Um, and that's why, that's what got me interested because um, I thought that was a really good research question. <laughs> and that's, that's the question I've been working on ever since. Um, in some capacity, I've worked on other separate problems, but, uh, that's the main question. Um, and I wasn't really convinced by, I mean, we read literature from philosophers of race, which, you know, they had their various views. Uh, a popular view was, uh, social constructionism, uh, the way that we carve up race. It's non-biological at its core, uh, it's just a made up social constructs, um, and that was a popular view, but I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't convinced by that view. I thought that was um, not really, it was, certainly wasn't mapping onto my experience growing up as uh, African-American male in the South. Um, you know, it felt like there was something very biological to, to the way that we were talking about race in the South. Um, and then there was uh, Anthony Appiah's work in race was popular in the late nineties. Um, so he thought that yes, the way that we carve up race is biological, but it's so packed with all kinds of outdated biology that our racial groups don't exist. And, and our term race doesn't refer. So he's an air theory, so to speak. And I was like, yeah, that's, I'm not, I'm not really buying that one either. <laughs> yeah. I was like, ah, to say that they don't exist, though, it's like, that's, that's, a, that's a bit strong, you know. But, you know, these are the different metaphysical positions that that I was exposed to. And um, it was just really intriguing um, to to see all that tie, tie in together. So, I mean, as you can tell, I, I was interested in philosophy of race for purely scientific metaphysical reasons. Um, trying to figure out what's in the world and whether these scientists 
where their language was mapping onto what was in the biological world, the genetic world in particular. Um, and uh, it's been a really rich and interesting sort of journey uh, so far. So, so I, I want to get more into that and into the journey. But before we start talking more about that, I am curious because race and discussions of race are so uh, politically, socially, uh, ethically charged. I wonder if do you have to treat it differently than your work in more, I'll, I'll just use the word agnostic areas of the philosophy of science. I imagine you can voice objections to something about time travel or natural kinds and not worry about deeply offending or upsetting someone or getting yeah. notes to the administration. And I wonder if even in your public work on, on just writing, publishing in journals, this is something that you have to keep in mind. Yes. Um, it's just, I mean, I, I've, I've actually thought for a while that um, it's a bit puzzling why philosophers, when they do research, don't aren't required to go through any ethical clearance or anything. Hmm. Um, you know, we, and we work on all kinds of stuff that can have um, huge implications on society. Uh, but for our research, you know, nobody <laughs> just, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I think it, even though, you know, we don't have these required, you know, uh, ethical clearances to do research. I try to do research in a way because of the topics I work on, uh, that, that are, are sensitive, pay attention to, um, uh, certain complications that can certainly arise. So, uh, as you can imagine, given how I was talking about uh, racial anti-realism and social constructionism about race, uh, my initial solutions to this this problem of um, what is race and what's the reality of race was a biological realist solution. And I imagine that um, upsets I thought that, a lot of people. Yeah. So I. I thought that that was, in all honesty, the best uh, metaphysical theory to capture. And I was just focused on contemporary American English. So it was it was it was it was, rest it was constrained. Uh, but even so, um, uh, I mean, I defended the theory because I thought it was true. But that you can't be so naive as to think that that's all that's required of you as a researcher who's working on this, <laughs> you know, this sort of touchy issue. So I, I did include in probably my highest cited paper, defending biological realism about race, um, a disclaimer about appropriate, inappropriate ways of reading what I just wrote. Um, and, uh, you know, that wasn't, uh, you know, it was, it was a perfectly, uh, uh, true and, and justified thing to say. Um, but it was something I felt uh, was necessary to say um, in order to stave off uh, certain additional uh, readings that people could get And You know, those readings still came to be honest, <laughs> you know, but at least I had, I had made a statement about my stance on. So, so just to be a little more specific um, uh, you know, the white nationalists, uh, love academic defenses of biological realism. Oh, about really? Race. I, that hadn't occurred to me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 They, they, they have their own name for it. They call it race realism. Um, so I, I, I don't use that terminology. <laughs> I say racial realism and I, I encourage all philosophers working in metaphysics of race to use racial realism instead of race realism, because then Google's going to tag you in certain ways. Um, but, uh, no, they, they were very happy to see what I was working on. And some of them contacted me, um, and some of them said they were thrilled and, you know, <laughs> wanted to advertise my colloquium talks. That must know, be a really the, bad feeling. And, you know, I, I, you know, I cut it off at the nip. I said, look, you know, we're, we are not on the same side of these, these sort of issues. Um, because I mean, if you know my history, you know, I, I got into this exactly to try to find out what went wrong with the bell curve. 
And these individuals are, you know, trying to defend books like the bell curve and um, uh, going through like philosophical research like mine. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've like, like uh, had sort of private conversations with white nationalists, distancing myself from them. They still latch on to my work. They still latch on to work from other philosophers of race who have defended biological realism, like Michael Hardiman. Um, I've seen his work referenced on Stormfront. Um, so yeah, I keep tabs on, you know, what, how, you know, people are digesting our work outside of the Academy. Um, and his work is actually cited on Stormfront more than mine. Um, but I mean, that could have something to do with, I've, I've changed my views since, since, uh, my early days, but, um, yeah, so those are things you have to think about. And then you also have to think about more subtle problems that can arise, like lots of educational sociologists, uh, have done research showing that um, even just using racial language when also reading or learning about certain topics that are stereotypically tied to racist stereotypes. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of work from Brian Donovan um, on when you're, when you're introducing and talking about genetic diseases in the human species. If you use racial language, that's been probabilistically tied with uh, the learners, the readers, um, absorbing that information in a way that reinforces negative racist uh, attitudes and stereotypes. Um, so just just reading, right? Just like if you just couch the information that you're trying to convey to someone, um, like, I don't know, uh, 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 you know, sickle cell anemia is more disproportionately um, it more disproportionately affects black people than white people, something like that. Um, and even if you use more subtle words like African versus Caucasians, it doesn't matter. The research shows that um, a certain segment of the population is a probabilistic um, an increased likelihood that they're going to develop racist attitudes. For them. They're going to develop a certain kind of opia style concept of race like this kind of bad biological concept of race, and then that's going to be. So um, to, to counteract that, in that research, uh, Donovan and colleagues found that, well, actually, this doesn't happen for uh, subjects who are adequately educated about genetics, <laughs> right? Hmm. And so I like to put it at the beginning of my talks, or um, I'm writing some books right now, um, have some intro genetics uh, kind of couched in the text. And that's that's not just helpful for people to really actually fully understand what you're doing, um, but it also it can help with uh, people taking away the wrong messages subtly, right? Um, so that's kind of how I like to approach that issue. I don't, I'm not a big fan of, oh, we just shouldn't do this sort of research. Um, um, I'm a big fan of, well, what are the obstacles? What? Why do? Why do people misinterpret and uh, misappropriate research like that when they do? Mm -hmm. And if one of the big reasons is well, they're just not very educated on genetics, and I'd rather live in a world where people are more educated. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so that's kind of the route I like to take. Oof. I'm just so struck by that the idea of of white nationalists trying to appropriate your work. It, it sort of reminds me of like a. The, some of the scientists at the Alamo project who were just committed to like science, but then they end up accidentally producing, well, I don't accidentally probably isn't the right word, but they end up producing something that can be used as a weapon. And in this case, I mean, people want to use your work to inflict pain and suffering on other people, even though they might not uh, couch it in those terms. So that's, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's not just the work. I mean, it's also, who I am, right? Because um, I can write stuff that won't get uh, the kind of side eye <laughs> that um, if I were uh, just a regular white guy, um, I wouldn't be able to write. Like, it would, it would just be career ending, <laughs> so to speak. Um, in fact, most of the most of the big biological realists in philosophy of race, Lucius Outlaw, uh, Michael Hardiman, myself, all been black. 
Interesting. <laughs> right. That's, um, that's, a, that's really And I don't think that's an accident. I think there's only uh, certain people who can even explore um, uh, in a scholarly way uh, certain ideas without just immediately committing career suicide. So. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to like the work of your career <laughs> and the philosophy of race itself, now you mentioned that modern, well, philosophy of race started in sort of modern philosophy with, with Kant. And I've talked to uh, some philosophers of physics, philosophers of math, and it's been very illuminating going back um, to like antiquity and how philosophy of certain areas have changed over time. And I'm curious about what Kant's writings on philosophy of race were like and how how that's related to what you're doing today. Uh, yeah, I, I'll make a disclaimer because these historical debates get very heated sometimes, um, sometimes even more than race debates. Um, so who developed, who was the first philosopher of race or who first did philosophy of race uh, is something that people argue about. And is there's two ways of thinking about that. Um, when I say Kant was the first philosopher of race, um, I'm not saying that he was the first philosopher to have worked in race theory. Uh, what I'm saying is it's kind of like what a uh, phylogeneticist would, how, how they frame things. Um, so if you look at the philosophy of race happening today, and then you try to trace intellectual influences, and you keep going back and keep going back, keep going back, the oldest philosopher you reach is Immanuel Kant, <laughs> right? So if you start with work from myself, uh, uh, Lucius Outlaw, Anthony Appia, blah, 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 and you just keep digging back, digging back, digging back, you get to Immanuel Kant and you won't find an earlier philosopher cited. Um, now, that's not to say there might not have been some activity going on in ancient Greece or something, and there's some argument to be made that the way they're using some term was a racial term. Like, I don't know. But I do know that <laughs> in thinking about it in the way that I'm, I'm talking about it, Immanuel Kant would be the first. Now, um, what did he write and who was he responding to? Um, you know, Kant did a lot of stuff, and yeah. he wasn't just a philosopher. I mean, he was arguably an astronomer and physicist um, and anthropologist. Um, and he has at least four, maybe five papers in anthropology on race, specifically just on race. Um, and before and after sort of the critical period sort of, sort of talk. <clears throat> and um, they're all pretty objectionable. <laughs> so, so, so Kant is is widely credited as being um, uh, kind of the first scholar to really give a solid theoretical basis to uh, 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 the sort of uh, uh, racist racial hierarchies that European explorers and so forth were already adopted. So he was trying to substantiate um, them. Well, so this is, I, I don't like to get into the psychological. Okay. I don't know. He, but um, he was maybe not trying to substantiate them, but he was a varying positions that gave credence to the, to what the explorers were. Finding. Yes. And I would be even stronger. I mean, his work was, was cited by, uh, later scholars who were directly <laughs> involved in um, kind of the more dastardly, because, you know, Kant, he really didn't get around. He didn't go very many places. Yeah, he like would walk around um, his village he, and that's it. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't directly do anything uh -huh. to subjugate blacks or native Americans. Uh, but his work was definitely cited and engaged with and taken seriously and, and seen to have provided some kind of scholarly, justification for a lot of stuff that was going on back then. Um, and whether that was his intention, I don't, I don't know, but um, it's certainly, I mean, it was, it was very highly cited and serious taken work among race scholars who were mostly life scientists back then. Um, so I know his work was highly engaged with by Johann Blumenbach, 
who's widely considered to be sort of the first physical anthropologist um, and whose work influenced um, Samuel George Morton, um, who is kind of the OG of racist uh, ideology and racist hierarchies in science. Um, he was a, uh, uh, an alum of, of Penn, actually. Did it, I, think, I think he does medical work um, here. And um, he wrote Crania Americana. And basically, could you repeat Crania Americana? Crania Americana. It's a, a classic Americana. book in in history of race scholarship. It was a book in craniometry. Yeah, I saw that you teach um, a, bit, a bit about craniometry, and that's something that I wanted to get to. There are really so many things to get to. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about um, these sorts of yeah, things in, well, in detail. So craniometry was kind of the uh, the the measurement side of phrenology phrenology okay. is kind of like an outdated neurobiology basically they were studying the brain and trying to find connections from the brain to the mind um i, I mean they were very coarse so they believed in things like well they, they believed in things that like the brain is divided up in the parts and these parts do different different have different functions so we kind of kept that but um, like very specific, fun, like there was a destructiveness part of, of the brain, like things like that, that stuff, kind of stuff we've, we've thrown out. Um, but uh, Morton was the first phrenologist to propose, well, we really need to have reliable ways of measuring the stuff that we're claiming. Hmm. Right. So kind of like the what psychometrics is to psychology. Right. They, they're the ones that developed um, all these tests that we talk about, the SAT, IQ, all that stuff. Um, so he said, look, I want to have a way to measure uh, cognitive ability, intelligence, a way to measure, you know, all this other stuff. And so that was craniometry. Now, there is very coarse measurement techniques. Um, so his measurement technique for uh, um, uh, cognitive ability was cranial capacity, which was literally uh, cubed inches uh, uh, for the volume of, of your skull. And so, you know, you collect a bunch of skulls and, you know, find averages and ranges and so forth and try to use different, he'd use seeds sometimes, he'd use metal balls sometimes uh, uh, to measure, uh, get this uh, inches cubed. Um, so in any case, uh, uh, Samuel George Morton was a very famous um, 19th century phrenologist um, and at the beginning, and because of Crania Americana, partly that was like his big breakout book. Um, in the book, one of the main accomplishments was uh, scientifically proving the. Uh, I'm doing this like I'm not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, the hierarchy of intellectual endowment. That's his his term among the races, and he had. Uh, whites on top, and he had blacks on the bottom, and Native Americans were second, and blah blah blah. And this is all the, this was all arrived at from measuring samples of skulls from the races, and uh, using cranial capacity as the uh, measurement um, unit. And so um, he got very famous for that work. And what's interesting is when you read that book, in the in the introduction of the book, like if you're a philosopher, you're thinking, well, okay, what's his racial scheme what like, who do you think who, who does he think the races are he has no theory of of the races he completely gets it from boomenbach is it boomenbach or blumenbach uh blumenbach uh, i'm not a german speaker okay, so okay, okay. <laughs> uh johan blumenbach okay. is 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 how i would pronounce it and that's partly not a coincidence blumenbach was was funding his lab to some extent <laughs> but um uh, Blumenbach was also, in his own right, a very um, well-known race theorist, uh, highly cited race theorist. You said theorist. he was a, a physical anthropologist? Physical anthropologist. Okay. They call themselves biological anthropologists today. Uh, they, they're, still, they're, they're still around. Is um, it a racist endeavor, yeah. what they're doing still? Or is it, just, is it, <laughs> is it not that way anymore? Um, they, I'll say that they're not trying. Well, I mean, is it accepted in the academy? Because I just haven't heard this term before. Is it like just a it's, white? Oh nationalist? yeah, yeah, yeah. They're accepted. I okay. mean, if you go in any highly ranked department of anthropology, you have biological anthropologists. Okay. Um, 
now sometimes you have different departments because they argue with each other, uh, the cultural anthropologists and the biological anthropologists. But um, in any case, um, Blumenbach, he has, uh, his racial scheme came out of work from his dissertation and what we read from Blumenbach is from his dissertation. There are iterations of that publication that we cite from Blumenbach where he's explicitly responding to work from Kant and he's changing his racial classification. So he started off with four races and then he ended up with five by 1795. And he's responding to Kant. So here you have um, Kant influencing uh, the later science in the next century um, that basically was uh, one of the first uh, uh, widely accepted scientific um, um, demonstrations of the uh, intellectual inferiority of the non-whites uh, compared to the whites. Um, and in fact, Morton's work was cited in lots of political um, um, endeavors in the United States. Um, he's a very famous scientist. And in fact, when we annex Texas, right, Texas split from Mexico, and then we absorb Texas, um, um, we were debating about whether to absorb Texas as a slave state or a non-slave state, of course. And the politicians of the time, uh, one of which was John C. Calhoun, I believe, who was, um, he was a senator, and then he later became a, a secretary of state, I believe. Um, he was citing Morton and saying, look, these people are inferior. <laughs> we have the scientific evidence. Um, this needs to be a slave state, right? Um, so that's, <laughs> that's that's what I mean by Kant had this very substantial influence. Um, and in fact, in Kant's work, um, he defended his own sort of uh, racial hierarchy. Um, and he even made comments to the effect uh, that we can actually justify how we should enslave certain sorts of minorities. So he thought that blacks should be enslaved as field slaves and Native Americans should be enslaved as domestic slave. So this is all in the Kant. Wow. Um, I'm thinking of a 1777 paper. Um, what, and... what was his philosophical basis for drawing distinctions between people like this? Oh, I mean, the Kant is interesting. So people took it seriously because, I mean, you know Kant. Kant's thoughtful, right? Yeah. And so he starts off his, his work in race theory by saying, I'm going to break from how people have been doing race theory before, which has mostly been system, systematic biologists, taxonomists. Uh, people like uh, uh, Carl Linnaeus, um, Count de Buffon. And is that more and, phrenolog just phrenology type stuff? No, 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 no. This is, this is, this is even before phrenology. Um, so this, we're in the 1700s now. And um, this is systematic biology. It was pretty straightforward to try to do, try to do racial classification and um, across all species, not just not just humans. And um, but back then, the way that we did taxonomy was largely by looking at morphological traits, right? Or other easily observable traits, uh, behavioral traits, things like that, linguistic traits. And um, um, so these other these other uh, uh, race theorists in in biology. Uh, like Linnaeus, would classify the human species and the races according to easily recognizable, visible, physical features, basically. And Kant, he starts his race theory by saying, those are systems for memorization, not systems for understanding. Right? Mm -hmm. you, know, that's, you know, he takes a little hit at you right before he's... Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to develop a system of understanding of race, right? Not just an uh, easy way of classifying, you know, traits... Um, I want to get at sort of what's responsible for generating the trait clusters that we see, right? And so he kind of uh, goes in a direction that was getting popular. Um, it has to be tied to reproductive connections in some way, genealogical connections. And he ends up uh, defining race in a very new way. It was completely novel for for the time period. Um and it's basically some combination of um, 
there is some a little bit of visible physical feature stuff in there, but it's mostly like kind of like lineage based and within some kind of reproductive community, right? Which was new. And in addition to that, Kant had a theory of heredity because he also wanted a way to to account for how these different, he called them deviations. These are the specific kinds of traits that lead to races. And he, he needed a theory on how these deviations came about. And the theory he came up with it was pretty interesting. It's like an early theory of heredity. Of course, you know, you get Mendel in the next century, uh, like 1850s. Um, and he thought that all humans back, back when we were, you know, the original humans um, had the same, he called them seeds, the same seeds. These are his units of heredity. And if, if some subgroup of, of humans went off into another geographic region, then the climate, specifically the sun and the air, would kind of activate certain seeds and not activate others. All right, so we all have the same genetics, so to speak, but then certain ones get activated when your ancestors move to a certain geographic region. Um, once they get activated, they get fixed. So notice how that's different from contemporary notions of like mutation, where you can have a mutation in one direction and you can, it can go back, <laughs> you know, down to lineage, just depends on, you know, various factors. Uh, but once it gets activated, it gets fixed. And those activations are, these are your, these become your deviations. These deviations are kind of um, uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, variation that persist over, over many generations, right? And the kinds that lead to races persist over many generations, precise, over many generations precisely because they can't go backwards. They get fixed, right? Now, there's other parts of his definition of race. After enough time, those different groups with these different deviations become races, right? Those sufficient conditions get satisfied. But because of the types of traits they are, they're irreversible, right? So now you can kind of see where he's going to get a hierarchy. Um, different mm -hmm. continental regions activate different seeds. And according to Kant in Africa, uh, because of course, human species didn't begin in Africa. We migrated there. Of um, course. Right. <laughs> was, was Europe the yeah, center that was, that was, back then? Um, well, it's interesting. There's a region that contains um, like modern Germany and so forth, but it's, it's a little bit broader. It also would contain modern Iran, but um, it's, okay. it's, it's not in Africa. <laughs> it's, it's more like, uh, like West Asia and Europe. Now, in Africa, once we migrate to Africa, according to Kant, um, the seeds that got activated um, made blacks uh, uh, thick-skinned, strong, but lazy. All right, irreversible. All the descendants have these 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 features. Um, and that was part of his justification for why they would be good in the field. These would be good field slaves, but you do have to whip them every now and again to get them going because they're lazy, right? So this is this is Kant's race theory, right? Yeah. And this was influencing travelers and um, you know other you know, high status European scientists and so forth. Um, and um, of course, what was so appealing about it is grounded in the same sort of um, original and you know fairly thoughtful philosophy that Kant is known for. And it was right? self-serving. He's trying to them. break away from the the morphological stuff that people were doing and focus on something that gets at more of what's responsible for the morphological clustering. And um, just so happens <laughs> you get this racial hierarchy out of it, right? So, um, so that was uh, Kant's uh, um, uh, sort of race theory in a nutshell. Now, I didn't give any specifics, but I'm, I am writing an introduction to philosophy of race book, 
where I do get into the specifics if anyone's interested. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. I will make sure to note that in the introduction. I'll make a note of that now. But so you said that the the next turn sort of came in the seventies or eighties. Is I think I think that would, that's what you said. You can correct me, but mm-hmm. it, that's when race was begun to think of as a social phenomenon rather than a biological phenomenon. Um, uh, no, that, that, uh, not quite. Okay. Um, so you had people thinking about race as a social phenomenon as, as far back as Du Bois in the late 1890s. Okay. Um, this, uh, you know, the, the renowned sociologist, philosophically thinking sociologist. Um, and he was directly responding to people in the 1800s who were like people like, uh, Samuel Morton and so forth. Um, but, and, you know, to, and to be fair, there was, there was a continuous philosophizing on race throughout the 20th century. The only reason I, I highlighted uh, the seventies and eighties is because if you want to look at how we came to have philosophy of race as an AOS, the thing that was, that, that you can get a job in now, um, you go. You got to go back to the seventies and eighties with people like uh, Bernie Boxel, Anthony Appiah, uh, Howard McGarry. Um, they were doing a lot of work to kind of mainstream philosophy of race because it was it was still going on um, in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, for example, Elaine Locke was, you know, a very influential philosopher of race. She was um, the chair of Howard's department. Uh, philosophy for a while. Uh, and also a lot of people credit him with kind of uh, 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 proposing the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, uh, so he was, he was doing work that was making an impact on, you know, later movements. Um, but it, it wasn't a sort of thing that would bring philosophy of race into the mainstream and be the sort of thing that you could put on your resume and you could get a job in. Um, so that, that, that's why I highlighted the seventies and eighties. Um, but so, yeah, so in the seventies and eighties, some interesting stuff was happening. Like, uh, Boxel was showing other, uh, Anglophone philosophers, uh, largely in the analytic tradition, um, how these, these race issues are actually very important to the issues they were already caring about in political philosophy. Um, like if you cared about, social justice, right? Like a lot of people were very excited about Rawls's work, you know, theory of justice in the seventies and blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, you also needed to care about race theory because you, you, you're you not going to be able to articulate a very convincing theory of justice without handling um, the appropriate treatment of races. Uh, actually, Charles Mills did a lot to uh, get people to wrestle with that. He thought that Rawls had a uh, kind of a fundamentally flawed way of thinking about how to deal with those problems. But uh, in any case, um, it was it was that sort of uh, say, oh, you care about this? Well, here's a problem in race theory then, right? And Appiah uh, did that with metaphysics and philosophy of language because he was trained as a philosopher of language. And in the 80s, he started writing stuff. It's like, well, um, you, know, um, you know, if we care about, you know, what exists in the world, <laughs> you know, and also in the early nineties, then, you know, race is this very perplexing question about, you know, he has this paper early nineties. Um, but what are you really in general philosophy where, um, he, he starts off talking about Kripke's work and, you know, Kripke has this theory of individual identity, uh, like personal identity, so to speak in naming and necessity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he proposed this kind of like historical constraint and quasi genetic constraint on what makes you the individual you are. And then it's like, well, obviously, well, how far does that extend? Does that work for race? Does it work for gender? And he explored these other things. Right. So he kind of like you know, piqued the interest of metaphysicians and said, hey, if you're interested in this, you should be interested in race and gender. Could I be stuff, black so. in another possible world? Or something like that. Exactly. That's exactly the kind of questions, you know, mm-hmm. he was he was asking. So um, that kind of mainstreaming 
allowed philosophy of race to get to these you know, big journals like Journal of Philosophy, wow. Philosophy of Science. Mm-hmm. Robert Andresen did a lot to uh, mainstream philosophy of race and philosophy of science uh, in the 90s. And, um, you know, gets us to our current position where, you know, there's so many job ads for philosophy of race. It's it's kind of stunning, <laughs> you know, today. Um, but, yeah, so the, the big issues back in the 70s and 80s, things like what is racism? What is race? Is race real? And um, ancillary issues like what's the right way to think about black reparations? That's like Boxel's work. Um uh, is and also in the 70s and 80s, this is when affirmative action was getting started. Um, it looks like it might, it's probably going to be ending soon because of the Supreme Court. But um, they were also wrestling with that. So is affirmative action uh, socially justified? Is it is it reverse racism? Like what's what's going on there? So these are the sorts of issues that they were they were tackling that, that really uh, brought a um, a newfound attention from. Uh, more mainstream metaphysicians, mainstream political philosophers, and so forth. So I uh, look very different from somebody who, from the majority of people who are native to Nigeria or native to China or I don't know uh, Peru. So on a on a prima facie level, it just I feel like most people think that race it has some biological origin, which makes it more surprising to me that the standard view um, or the the standard accepted view among like biologists or philosophers or anthropologists at present and again correct me if i'm wrong is that race is not biological and that it's social mm-hmm. so they there must be some very compelling arguments against the common folk intuition that most people have so I wonder mm-hmm. what what is so appealing about this the standard view that can diffuse like these basic intuitions that most people just have naturally. Like you mentioned, you had it in high school. Um, the 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 standard view is the the like quasi biological view, right? I thought the standard view was that biological races don't exist in humans. Oh, oh, okay. That standard view. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I was, I thought you were talking about like because you said, like from an ordinary perspective, like I don't look like a a black person. I don't look right. right. So I think the 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 All folk right. view is that races are biological, but the standard view among these academics, it, academics, is that right okay. there aren't. So I'm wondering what it is, what right. their views, the biologists, the anthropologists, the philosophers, what they believe <laughs> accounts for what. Nat- most people believe and what their positive argument in favor of the the standard view that races are social is yeah i want i want to do justice to this because this is an important question um so first off i think there is it is very muddled what the standard views are both among the folk and academics let's start with the academics um, there's two things going on, <laughs> at least two things. Uh, there's a standard view of whether, um, homo sapiens has, has biological races subdivides into real biological races. And that's a debate that's been going on since the beginning of sociology. It's, it's very deep in anthropology and that nat- what we call biology naturalism back then in the 1700s, 1600s even. Um, and that, I think, is more of what biologists and biological anthropologists, people who study, people in the life sciences, that's more of what they're thinking of um, when, like, you can see this in the literature, um, when they talk about race. And they don't, they don't, a lot of times, preface that. They just say, look, I don't think races exist. But then when you pry, and there's some sociologists that have looked into this, like Anne Morning, she has a book, uh, The Nature of Race, where she uh, very interestingly focuses on academics. And she she studies them. She does uh, uh, interviews. She does uh, surveys. And she finds some interesting stuff. And one is that actually it's not true 
that the majority of biologists and biological anthropologists think that humans don't have biological races. Um, there's, a, there's a slight majority for biologists who think that they they do have we do have biological races, and there's a, a majority of biological anthropologists. But if you look at cultural anthropologists and um, just from ordinary observation, uh, humanists like philosophy professors, English professors, it's the exact opposite. Right? They're, they're almost all social constructionists um, and they don't think we have biological races. So it's, it's a bit of, so when you talk about academics, you kind of have to qualify who. Sure. Um, and what was interesting about Morning's work is the biologists, when they think about this question, they're very careful. Um, so they're not going to say, well, the way I'm thinking about biological races is Samuel Morton's way. And I think that we have, those, right. He's not going to say that. Uh, but they say more subtle things like, well, if we think about races as like fuzzy populations that, you know, blah, 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 have genetic variation in some kind of way, then yeah, I can, yeah, I think we have races. Um, but if you get more, if the standards become higher, are these subspecies um, or something like that, then you tend not to get that response from biologists. Um, so it's a really it's a really tricky tricky issue among um, academics, and then when you go over to the the cultural anthropologists and the the philosophers and the English professors, they're mostly focusing on the folks understand like like how racial classification works outside of the history of biology, in you know uh, educational settings, in law, and I mean that was the the critical race there is, for example, they started in American law schools um, and they were focused on how uh, our racial language works in history of law. And um, so they're not even really, my view is they're not even really talking to each other to a substantive hmm. extent. Uh, if you get a, a taxonomist in a room with a critical race theorist from a law school, they're not, they're not even in the same race debate as far as I'm concerned. Um but uh, to the extent that, so if you shift over to this other race debate, talking about the folks' use of race, um, then I do think that there's a large majority, of especially social scientists and humanities professors in the academy that are social constructionists. That's, I think that's true. Um, um, and then you can ask a third question, well, what do the ordinary people think, <laughs> right? Which, you know, the academics who are social constructionists working in critical race theory or social constructionists otherwise, they think that they're theorizing on the ordinary people's racial classification. But um, you can have very interesting debates about what kind of evidence is appropriate to make the kind of inferences they're making. Um, so, for example, if you were to, to say, well, let's look at some surveys and try to extrapolate what ordinary folk mean by race in the surveys, you're not going to get a lot of evidence for social constructionism, <laughs> right? Because those surveys have a heavy biological undertones um, to the extent that you find any patterns at all. Sometimes it's just a mess. But when you do find patterns, they're often very biological patterns. So, for example, take... Um, the American public's response to racial dolezal 2015. Mm -hmm. um, we've done very high quality statistical surveys on the American public's response to that. Uh, take, for example, the YouGov National Survey of U.S. Adults. And 65% of them, maybe even more, at least 65%, uh, said that, nope, she was wrong to like uh, represent herself as Black uh, and and by wrong I mean inaccurate, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, it was always inaccurate, right? Now I put that on because there are some social constructionist theories that could account for um, why, under a social constructionist theory, uh, Dolezal is not black now, but they would be forced to saying that she was. It would, it would be hard from the wiggle out of saying that she was black at some point, mm. given how she was treated and how she came to fame. She, she came to fame from reported, reporting um, uh, racial bias from the police. 
because she was a Africana uh, studies professor. She was a, a part-time professor and she worked at different universities across state lines and she would go to Idaho sometimes. And she said that when she would drive back, they would frequently pull her over for, according to her, driving while black. And they would put that she was black on the, the, the tickets and so forth. Um, so there are, there are definitely social constructionist theories that um, would have a hard time saying that in those moments she wasn't black. Huh. But according to the surveys, the majority, overwhelming majority of American public say, nope, she never was black. And then when you probe more on the surveys and you ask why they think that, they say biological ancestry. She doesn't have the right biological ancestry. And they have different views on, you know, how much is enough. Uh, some people think, you know, having a grandparent is enough. Uh, you need to have a parent that's enough. You know, so there's different sort of disagreement on that. But there's widespread agreement, <laughs> you know, among the American public that Dolezal was, was, is not black, was never black. And the reason why she was never black was a biological ancestry. So the social constructions have to have a way of either explaining away that kind of data um, or a way of incorporating it into the theory and using the data as evidence. Uh, now, I know that some philosophers of race who are social constructionists um, have explained, uh, attempted to explain away the data by saying things like, well, uh, the way that race is socially constructed in the United States is such that uh, it depends on racist ideology and racist ideology is also playing into the reports on the surveys to undercut the reliability of surveys. Um, so this is something that Sally Haslanger has said in print in the 2009 paper. Um, and so, you know, they, there, there are ways that you can sort of, sort of, uh, you know, kind of account for that. But then you want to ask, well, well then where does the, the empirical evidence come from for your theory? And then they tend to work, they tend to look at things like uh, large scale practices and policies, right? Instead of uh, like surveys from, from social scientists. Um, and from those practices, policies, that's where they, they take, take it to be the case that they have good evidence for a non-biological basis. So in other words, the way that we racial classify is intertwined with racist ideology which is undermining the reliability to what might seem to be straightforward ways of getting evidence for a race theory. So we have to look at more subtle ways to get evidence for a race theory. And according to those more subtle ways, the best theory is a social constructionist theory. I mean, that's, that's basically uh, the lion's share of how they defend, defend their views, while at the same time uh, accounting for the, the biological sort of uh, uh, facts that we see uh, showing up in the surveys. Mm -hmm. Well, I I have a ton more questions, but and I know we didn't really even get to your views really that that you're defending and arguing for, but I also know that you have a meeting that you have to go to soon. Yeah. So, I mean, you've been a really wonderful guest and I'm really thankful that you came and had this conversation with me. So, and I I'd love to do it again sometime. It was a pleasure. Um I, I, I do. I am working on two books. One is the introduction to um, philosophy of race and another tentatively titled A Pluralist Solution to the Race Problem. Um, and that that's my sort of race theory. OK. Uh, updated to the present day. Um, so very well, uh, very brief, briefly, I mean, in a couple of minutes, what is what is the elevator pitch for the pluralist solution? Yeah. So. Um, I'm, I'm coming, you know, uh, to philosophy of race from philosophy of science and in particular philosophy of biology. And in philosophy of biology, there's this very big metaphysical debate about what is a species. And it's a very old debate. It uh, goes back to the beginnings of taxonomy. And around the 70s, you start to get, because everybody was saying, oh, this is what a species is. This is what a species is. This is what a species is. Around the 70s, you started getting people saying, well, maybe there's a plurality of things of what a species is. It's called species pluralism. And, you know, they're generating very interesting defenses of that. Um, and so in philosophy of science, especially philosophy of biology, pluralism has been a, a technique to kind of addressing stubborn metaphysical debates. Um, and so I thought I might try it in the race debate. <laughs> and say, well, um, 
it looks like the social constructionists have, you know, an advantage in explaining some of this phenomena. Uh, the biological realists have an advantage explaining some of the other phenomena. Uh, what if it, what if we explore a different kind of race theory, a race theory that doesn't posit a single essence for race, but posits race basically a, as a polysemous term, uh, where the term is, is talking about different things. Uh, you, there's no unified theory, uh, so to speak, um, about what race is to account for all the phenomena we need to account for. Uh, there's kind of a di just a disjunction of things. Um, and um, so that's that's kind of the, uh, the elevator pitch, and uh, I'll be defending it in more detail uh, in the book, Racial Pluralism. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds great. So thanks again for joining me.